In this video, I discuss the historical Jesus coming from John Dominic Crossan's perspective. We get deep into the weeds. This is an episode you don't want to miss. Thank you to those who joined the Patreon. You get to view this before everyone else. Dom, tell us about the historical Jesus. What can we know with any fair confidence that he probably actually did and he probably actually said? Because I wanted to divide those into two things because, I mean, there's good reasons to think why someone might die. Yeah. <laughs> the actions. But, but also, can we be confident in things that he said? And if so, how do we know? Like, can you tell us about the historical Jesus? Yeah, and I'm going now for the, the basic. Okay. That Jesus did exist. There's a consensus of scholarship on that, and I think they're absolutely right. I am not sure anyone could so, so successfully fake a person like that, and I don't know why they bother doing it, to be honest with you. So no, I think Tacitus talks about Christians trying to explain who they were and goes back to Jesus, so does Josephus. Jesus existed, okay? The second surest thing we know about him, I would say, was that he was crucified again from Tacitus and um, Josephus, they were crucified under Tiberius by Pilate. And they also noticed that he was not, uh, sorry, his followers weren't rounded up. And that tells me, if that's all I had, that from the Roman point of view, this guy was not a violent rebel, or <laughs> there'd be at least 12 crosses up there, but he was a non-violent rebel. He was seditious in the Roman point of view. He was uh, alarming the people creating, he was what we would call an activist. Not just talking, but activism is on that dangerous cusp between violence and non-violence. So he was an activist. And that's exactly what I would expect Rome to do with an activist. You crucify the leader, that'll finish his movement. Tacitus and Josephus kind of wonder why the movement continued and give their own explanations. Now, go back to his life. I think the surest thing we could say about Jesus it was he talked about the kingdom of God. Let me get rid of that term, God's rule on earth. That's what it means. Kingdom is kind of an old fashioned word, I know, and male word. So let's talk about God's rule. What would this world be like if God sat on Caesar's throne, <laughs> we would say? What if God was actually running the world? We might put it in American lingo and say, what if God drew up the federal budget? What would it look like? What would the priorities be? That's the religio-political meaning of the term God's rule on earth we're talking about. And you can see the political implications of that, of course. Now, how do I know that? In the, the enemies of Jesus, his enemies, who looked at John the Baptist and Jesus and would have considered both of them weirdos, dangerous weirdos maybe, agreed that John fasted and Jesus feasted. They got that. Now, they call them names, but I'm leaving out the names. You fast in preparation for something that's coming, Advent or Lent in the Christian calendar. You feast in celebration of something that has arrived. I take that as a very fair analysis of the difference. John, very much like most of the uh, tradition is saying, the kingdom of God, God's rule on earth is coming soon. That's the apocalyptic revelation. That it's not just coming in days to come at the end of time. It's coming soon. If, if you don't have any announcement about soon, keep your day job in the first century. Jesus is saying, as I understand it, Jesus is saying it's already here. That's, for example, the, the parable of the mustard seed. Find it in Mark and in Q and says the kingdom, the kingdom of God or God's rule is like a mustard seed. That's... If I was in the audience and Jesus came out with that one, I'd say, Jesus, are you nuts? A mustard seed and a domestic mustard seed? But, 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 but that, that grows in time. We've been told in the tradition that when God's rule come, it'll be bang, crash, and they'll beat their swords into plowshares and oh, everything will be perfect. And maybe Jesus said, yeah, did you notice that God wasn't beating the swords into plowshares? They were doing it. So the only way I can understand Jesus, speaking about the kingdom of God as already here, the only way, unless it's a cruel joke, it's like telling people in the middle of the pandemic that it's, it's gone. 
with people in hospitals gasping for breath and you say it's over. Not, how can you say, Jesus, the kingdom of God is already here? Tiberius, or what's his name, or is still, you know, on his throne, Antipas, Pilate. Nothing has changed. We've been told the kingdom of God, God's rule on earth, would make everything just and peaceful and perfect. Are you serious, Jesus? The only way I can understand him, if he says something like this as well, you guys have been waiting for God to do it for you. Soon, someday. God's been waiting for you to do it alongside God. It's about collaboration, not intervention. You might even use the words about a covenant. It's a two-way operation. There ain't a one-way covenant. So I think Jesus, in a way, operates with what you might call a paradigm shift, a tradition swerve, a disruptive innovation, as we say today, in Jewish tradition by saying God's rule is a collaborative affair. It's not about God's going to do it for you. Just hang in there, pray, wait, expect. But it's also not about here, grab a sword. We're going to go and do what the rebels did in the 60s right. and make sure that we make the kingdom happen. And that would be the very next question. Somebody might, I, I got it, Jesus. You're saying God's waiting for us to get our swords to your tents, O Israel. God is waiting for us to come out and fight with God. Is that right, Jesus? Am I getting it right? And that's where Jesus says, for example, we've recorded it in the great, the great sermon we call the Sermon on the Mount. You have to be nonviolent. Why? Because it'll bug the Romans or you won't get killed? No, because God in heaven is nonviolent. Look, says Jesus, God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Well, why doesn't he send a thunderstorm on the unjust and a gentle dew on the just? Why does he make the sun and the come up every day for the good and the bad? So... Your nonviolence for Jesus is programmatically grounded in Jesus's vision of God. God's rule, you, you, your action has to be nonviolent because you're collaborating with a nonviolent God. Now, of course, you could see all the objections. Wait a minute, Jesus, what about this? What about that? What about the others? So no wonder Jesus was talking all the time. But his argument would be, you've tried this. He wouldn't use this, but he said in 4 BCE, when I was born about, he might have said. You, Judas you tried. the Galilean you're talking about? Yeah, you, you tried that. For example, well, no, Judas Galileans would be in 6. Okay. See, that's the time of the, um, I, that was a non-violent one, I think. That was the first Jewish experiment with non-violent resistance. Under, that's why the legions, whenever the Jews rebelled violently, watch the legions march. They'll come south from their Syrian bases to put it down with fire and sword. Whenever you get a nonviolent movement against Pilate, say, or against uh, the, the statue of, of uh, Caligula, the legions don't have to come. The legions were bringing down the statue in that case, but there's nonviolent resistance as well. Sorry, I am got no, slightly it's necessary, off the subject, but let me put it this way. Between the violent revolt of 4 BCE and the Great War of 66 to 74, in those 70 years in between, there are repeated examples of Jewish, forget Jesus for a moment, Jewish experiments with organized, massive, nonviolent resistance. Not only against Pilate, for example, all of this is in Josephus, there's no secret, by the way, against Caligula's statue, they organized almost like sit-down strikes. They're experimenting with nonviolence because they've just seen what happened. In 4 BC, the legions came south and 2000 were crucified in Jerusalem. That's the way the Romans <laughs> operated. So I understand Jesus as announcing a sort of my terminology, a paradigm shift within the tradition that it is our language, you might call it a collaborative or a participatory eschatology. But it's a process. I mean, if you use the mustard seed, that's a growth process. If you, and he uses the domestic mustard seed, so that's one that you plant yourself. So I think Jesus is about collaboration. And then everything that comes from that, is it violent, is it nonviolent, flows from that. So that's the one thing I'm sure about. And I trusted not only on his announcement about the kingdom of 
God's rule being here, which had to raise that issue, violent, nonviolent, and Pilate's judgment. Pilate got it right. Trust Pilate. He crucified Jesus, but he didn't round up his, his close followers, we call the 12, or what, the 11 after Judas. What do we do with... <clears throat> Obviously, Paul did not meet Jesus. Yeah. He, in some way, persecuted them. What, what he actually did in his own letters versus what historical fiction acts wants to say he did, maybe two different things, but... Um, yeah, because here he is holding the uh, what the cloak of uh, yeah. the, <laughs> while they stone Stephen. So I see. Yeah, but in Paul, what do we see about a historical Jesus? Because many people will argue, they'll try to say, well, Paul doesn't really talk about a historical yeah. Jesus. He doesn't really care to mention his life, his family, where he comes from. Yeah. What he he doesn't even talk about him being a king of the Jews. Yeah. These ideas that we see in the Gospels. Um, so if we're looking for the historical, the earliest sources we can find that talk about a historical Jesus, yeah. do you see a historical Jesus in Paul anywhere? Uh, Paul is a little bit diffident, I think, about the fact that he wasn't there and he never met Jesus. I don't, he says, even if we knew him that way, we don't know him that way anymore. That's a little bit like, you know, responding when somebody says, did you go there? No, I wouldn't be bothered going there. You know, uh, you know, just answer the question. No, I didn't. You don't know Jesus during his lifetime. Yeah, Peter can pull that one on you. <laughs> you can claim that you have a revelation of Jesus, and so did Peter. That's fine. But Peter would walk around Galilee with him, and you didn't. So in one sense, he's not interested. But of course, crucial for Paul is that Jesus was crucified. Absolutely crucial. Without that, the resurrection doesn't make any sense. For example... Supposing Jesus had not been crucified, but had died of exhaustion or advanced old age, would Paul have said he was resurrected? Now, that's a sweeping theological question that's mm. never asked and should be asked. <laughs> because Paul would say, of course not. Right. Because th that is nice for Jesus and thank God, uh, nice for God to do it. But where's the just cosmic justice and all of that? He, no. So... Paul talks about resurrection. Now, anyone who, or crucifixion, I meant to say, sorry. If Paul was talking, say, to, let's say, some God worshippers, and he's talking about Jesus was crucified. Excuse me, Jesus, excuse me, excuse me. Why was he crucified? Can't die, can't stop there. Was he a runaway slave? No. Was he a criminal? Why was he crucified? You can't say somebody was crucified without kind of getting pulled in to explain why. Mm -hmm. what, the general idea would be if somebody is crucified, probably you're a criminal, though in, in a colonized country, you might well presume person who's crucified was anti-Roman or something. You could not explain something. And in fact, the closest Paul ever comes to almost quoting Jesus is that part in Romans, it's at the end of chapter 12, we almost quotes Jesus saying, love your enemies. He doesn't quite do it, but it's almost the same. That's the closest he ever comes to quoting Jesus. So Paul had to have known enough about the life of Jesus to understand crucifixion. Now, back up. Paul admits, he says it all the time, I was a persecutor. His conversion was from being a persecutor to being an apostle. You can't persecute, and if you're kind of an honest person like Paul, unless you know something about the people. Why would he persecute? And I don't give him this vision that Luke has of a sweeping persecutor all over Jerusalem, sent under, under authority of the high priest all the way to, to Damascus for rendition. That's rubbish. <laughs> no, no high priest has such authority to cross Roman boundaries or do anything like that. I think Paul was in the synagogue at Damascus and was a sort of a maybe self-appointed ideological enforcer. I don't know if that was his job. He knew all about this group within the synagogue. If, he couldn't have persecuted them if they were separate from the synagogue. He had no authority even within the synagogue. But if you were in the synagogue and were a Jew in the synagogue and you had messianic ideas or claims or anything else, 
you could be disciplined within the synagogue. They could toss you out, first of all, yeah. which would put you kind of lost between worlds. So it wasn't nothing. You know, if you were tossed out of the synagogue, you know, that would be, that would be serious. If you stayed in the synagogue, then you could be disciplined. You could be beaten. You could. So I think Paul was an enforcer in the synagogue at Damascus. That's the least we are sure. He certainly wasn't coming from Jerusalem on a mandate from the high priest. So I see him as a persecutor. Now, you cannot persecute without knowing enough about people, position, that you really don't like it. It annoys you. It infuriates you enough that you're going to try in his term, destroy it. Now, I don't think he could kill them. The Romans had their own ideas about who was allowed to kill whom, <laughs> at least publicly. So no, I don't think he's killing them. But he probably could get them ostracized from the synagogue. And that is no small thing. It's a, if you could imagine a small town somewhere where everyone is the same religion, small town somewhere in America where everyone is Roman Catholic, and somebody is tossed out of the Roman Catholic tradition, well, nobody goes to a store, nobody... So it's serious business. But he is a persecutor, and therefore he knew about him. Of course he knew about the life of Jesus. That's not his interest, though. The interest is the crucifixion resurrection. Hmm. It's really interesting to think about this whole conversion, because I've thought to myself, yeah, Paul <clears throat> absolutely knows uh, the Jesus movement, knows the sayings, has an idea of what yeah. this guy said. Um, especially if he's persecuting, he had to have investigated to know enough. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and some people think, well, you know, that, that Paul doesn't know anything and he's only, everything he's ever received and ever knows is from a revelation of Jesus. Good old Luke, no. Right. Right, remember, I mean, he himself in Galatians, he sums, he sums up his, let's call it conversion now, because we mean from a, from persecutor to apostle. And conversion is a fair word there, or it's vocation, if you will. He does it in one sentence. God, who knew me from my mother's womb and called me from my birth, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, mm -hmm. um, revealed his son to me, I'm almost going verbatim, that I might proclaim him to the Gentiles. That's it, one sentence. Luke takes <laughs> three full accounts. So, of course Paul knows it. Of course he knows it. He can't not know it. Not because he goes up to Peter and asks what a Galilean evening was like. He had to argue with these people. In the, in the Jewish synagogue, he didn't just say, I, I disagree with you, I'm going to persecute you. No, he didn't do that. You would have to argue, debate, either be, as I said, the self-enforced and approved enforcer, and that basically the synagogue is with you, to the general idea that this sub-movement or this group, this group within the synagogue, they had to be within the synagogue or he couldn't have touched them. You can't say that often enough. If there were a group out there of, of Gentiles, let's imagine, saying whatever they want, he couldn't have touched them. His only power was to toss them out of the synagogue, which was serious. But to do that, he had to know all they stood for. Mm. Uh, one more thing, if I may. I've heard people say that that the king of the Jews, we all have heard it, we've seen it written yeah. on the plaque up there on the crucifixion yeah. itself. This sedition <clears throat> from this render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, render yep. unto God that which is God, secret treason to him actually being told in some of the gospel narratives of his crucifixion that he would be a king uh, or be the king of the Jews. Do you think there's a historical kernel to the reality of him by his own group of Jews who followed him in thinking that he would actually be the king of the Jews? And this is why they hint. I don't have any evidence. Right. I, let me put it this way. In the first century, uh, Augustus is the son of God. And I would have no problem in theory with somebody looking at Jesus and looking at a coin say, well, you want to know what my son of God looks like? It's you, not what's his name over there in Rome. They understood in the first century that son of God was not some literal biological tampering with your mother. It was actually stating that you're the heir of God on earth. You represent God on earth. I don't think it would be advisable to say to Augustus, you understand you're just a metaphor. But he knew that 
Being son of God meant he represented God on earth. To say the same about Jesus. I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. Was it possible? Of course it's possible. In the title, the, Jesus talked about the rule of God. That was his theme. They wanted to talk about something else. Are you the Messiah? Jesus would probably have said, will you stay on the subject? Will you stay on script? <laughs> will you stay on message? It is about conducting the king of God's rule on earth. If you want to talk about how we will, don't talk about me. Well, you're proclaiming God's rule on earth. Who are you? Well, I don't know what answer you had to that. So this whole discussion about did Jesus say he was the Messiah, did he say he was some God, is again to make certain we don't talk about the real stuff, which is that Jesus claimed God's rule was already here on earth and we better join the program. Now, as I read that today, 2,000 years later, he is making a claim on me. I can say I'm not a Christian, I don't care, but that, that's fine. He's making a claim on the world. That includes me. I have to decide if I'm doing the historical Jesus, I have to describe accurately what his claim is, then I can say or not say, I think he was right or I think he was wrong. That's a separate issue. But if I am a journalist and a candidate bus who's running for president, he happens to be a Republican, I happen to be a Democrat, my job is to do a faithful record of what he's saying. I may be saying at the back of my mind, this is war, I don't believe a word of this. Fine, that's, you're not writing editorial opinion. So the same with Jesus. If I'm trying to do the historical Jesus, I'm trying to do my best, here's what Jesus is saying, then if you ask me, if you want to ask me, what do I think about it? I'll tell you, but I don't have to. That's where I move from history into theology. Um, so you, you didn't really um, want to go into this, but I figure at least on the record it might okay. be worth asking. <clears throat> Can you tell us your opinion of the mythicist model? It, at one point, okay. I, I guess at one point, yeah. um, it was taken seriously in academia in like – late 1800s, early 1900s, and then it started to fade away. I think after we had our Dead Sea Scrolls and we've yeah. done more investigation, That's we've right. learned a lot since then. Yeah. What is your opinion of mythicism? The idea that Jesus is either a s complete fictional celestial mythological yeah. character or something to that effect? Well, supposing I had the New Testament, uh, nothing else. I had just the New Testament story about Jesus. I think I could be easily persuaded. I mean, I, 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 I have no Greek material, no Roman material, no Jewish material. I just have, I'm presented like with the New Testament. It's kind of fallen from heaven. I, I probably wouldn't use the word myth about it because I tend to think, use myth only for transcendental values. And this guy seems to be walking around Galilee and he doesn't seem to be working like Mars and Venus, you know, make love, not war or something. So it would, just, it would bother me because it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be the pattern of other mythical stuff. But I could, I could easily say to myself, yeah, it could be myth. Now, the problem is we know too much history. <laughs> if I thought Augustus, you um, mentioned in an earlier conversation Suetonius' the description of Augustus, the powerful portents about his birth, what happened when he was coming of age with the toga, the portents about his death, and all he did in between. You could easily persuade me that this is a picture of the ideal Roman emperor. They wrote this maybe after they had Caligula and they had Nero and they wanted to show, so they're inventing a good emperor. But then I get down to the nitty gritty of the story. I say, boy, they really know stuff from the first century, from early first century that we can corroborate with other stuff. So I'd have to say, no, I don't think they're making up this story. But that depends on a lot of other material. If I only had Suetonius on Caesar Augustus and nothing else whatsoever, I could easily think it's a, a parable about the, the good emperor. Sure. So the, what's wrong with the myth of this position is they don't know enough history. Read Augustus. He is the son of God. He is the Lord. 
He's the God incarnate. He's the uh, redeemer from sin. He is, what else? Um, savior of the world. Every title that he has, all of a sudden I begin to see there's a new <laughs> character in town called Jesus of Nazareth. He's getting all of these titles. And he comes from a tiny little hamlet even. Uh, what can they possibly mean to get, say he's the Lord when everyone knows Caesar is the Lord? Mm -hmm. This smells to me if I'm a Roman official. It's either a very funny, no, it's, it's, a, it's a very dangerous joke. Maybe they're making a joke of our guy because they've got this Galilean peasant who is the Lord and the savior of the world. I'm going to investigate what's going on here. So when I see the whole, everything we've got from that period, no. They're making transcendental claims about Jesus, without a doubt. They're not saying he's a nice guy, he's got a good philosophy, um, he pats little babies on the head, tells great parables. No, they're not. They're saying he is a more appropriate ruler for the world than what's his face over there sitting on a Roman throne. That is treason. Or as I said, it's just a joke, but it's treason. And to give the Romans their credit, they recognize it was. So it's natural if Jesus is talking about God's rule on earth or the kingdom of God, maybe he thinks he's the king. I think Pilate was told this guy is going around talking about the kingdom of God, creating a movement, fostering trouble. They may well have said to Pilate, and he thinks he's the king. The Pilate would probably have laughed, you know. But you crucify people <laughs> for thinking thoughts like that. So I see no problem with Pilate putting king of the Jews. Not king of Israel, by the way. King of, not king of Israel. That's the confessional title. King of the Jews, that's exactly what Pilate would probably put up on the cross as his interpretation of, if you're talking about the kingdom of God, then you must think you're the king. And you're doing it here, so you think you're the king of the Jews. <laughs> I'll teach you. Yeah, it, it, all of it, it makes absolute sense to me. Better than when I watch people in that world who are making up stuff, really fiction. Boy, you can, you can smell the fiction all over the place. There is no nitty gritty that makes any sense. So I'm completely convinced that, yeah, they're making transcendental claims about Jesus. That's what a gospel is. Gospel is good news. If I tell you something is good news, you know I'm interpreting. X has become president. That's good news. No, that's my interpretation of the fact that somebody became president X. And I think it's good news. It might be bad news for you. These are valid interpretations of the fact that X became president. So now we're looking at Jesus, and if I'm doing historical Jesus research, I know he was crucified, I know he was worshipped within 100 years. I have to explain, honestly, why such different results for this guy. And why did the movement last? That's my job. Then I can say, I think I'm glad the movement lasted, that I'm stepping outside of my, and now I'm going to editorial. I'm moving from news to editorial. So if I'm trying to do history, I will try to describe the way I would have seen Jesus if I'd been there. But I will insist that Jesus is making claims. I won't say, well, he was just a nice guy and the nasty Romans or nasty high priests killed him just for being a nice guy. No. They killed him for making transcendental claims that were opposed to theirs. Thank you. Thank you.